Welcome to the latter half of January and welcome to the Fox 54 Week in Review. I'm Kenesha Dees. This is the only program in North Alabama devoted to condensing a week's worth of local headlines into a half hour program and it's only available here on Fox 54 Plus. Here's what's ahead for you in the next half hour. We continue our month long look at human trafficking. We examine who is likely to be targeted and why. Plus the challenges involved in bringing those at fault to prosecution. Your local lawmakers are gearing up to begin the year up at the Capitol. The public had the chance to hear from its representatives before they head back to Montgomery and to DC. And it's the state of the arts. Huntsville's Arts and Culture Appreciation Society Awards grants to homegrown artists. We'll bring you along for the ceremony. All right, but we'll start with weather and business. The snow and ice from last week may have melted away, but local stores and restaurants across North Alabama are dealing with what was left behind, namely a disruption to their bottom line. We look at what it'll take for them to rebound. Recent icy weather conditions here in the Rocket City and surrounding areas left many inside this past week. And now that's putting a strain on small businesses. Our Jasmine Birds takes us to Athens where we hear from a few of those owners firsthand. I'm told by local business owners right here in downtown Athens on the square that weather conditions this past week has brought a lot of tension and stress to their businesses with things like no heat as well as no shipments coming in for their customers. The central unit just in these temperatures is not able to keep up so we're having to dress in layers, as you see, that I'm having today. Meet Tammy Strickland, owner of Bean Bean's Boutique. Of course, you know, there's there's nothing coming in. I mean, you've the doors have been shut. The local business owner says it's been somewhat of a stressful week. I'm a single mom, so that's been, that's been a tough deal for us. Pimento store owner Teresa Brody feels the same way. So you're looking here for us five days of being closed. And even though we're open today, it's still very slow. So um, financially, you just stop and think about a whole week's worth of income. And another one of Brody's top concerns, no shipments. We were expecting new shipments to come in last week of new merchandise and we didn't get it in because trucks weren't you know, moving, and so therefore we missed that. We weren't here ourselves, so even if they did come, we couldn't accept the shipment because we weren't here. So we're impacted in a lot of ways. Um, we love what we do. I mean, all of us who have our local businesses, you know, are living our dreams. Now, these local business owners say they're looking forward to next week as weather conditions are expected to improve. They're just looking forward to more business, seeing their customers, and just moving forward in a positive light. For now, in Athens, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. This year will mark the 20th year for Pimentos in Athens. And they're celebrating in a heartfelt way each month by aiming to bring in something new. This month, they brought in a new candle called Alpha and Omega. And get this, for those who purchase the candle, part of the proceeds will go towards funding local children's school lunches. Not being able to pay for children's lunches, that portion helps take care of some of those kids. So I love that. So we're encouraging a lot of our customers to come and check this new candle out. And, and again, just that giving back to the community, which I love. Just like one day make big, big, you know, different, you know. John Arnold, owner of Big O's Cooking at Home at Clinton Row Shops on Clinton Avenue says last week's weather conditions definitely took her by surprise. It was ice. I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, people actually just whatever skating around here. And from a business standpoint. Financially, you know, it is pretty those, you know, those are hard for sure. Jeannie Gibson, owner of Creative State Gift Shop, agrees and adds that just because her business was closed, that doesn't stop the bills. Financially, we, we depend upon customers coming in and, you know, purchasing items or or us either, either at this shop or one of the others here in Clinton Row shops and when you don't have customers you have no income 
uh, but your rent is still due. Ashley Ingram, co-owner of AM Collective, says her business was already struggling a little after Christmas, so this just made it 10 times worse. Being out an entire week of revenue really hurts us, especially since things don't really pick up sales-wise until March. And on top of that, AM Collective has a short week. We're only open Wednesday through Saturday, so between the ice last week, closing us down for the entire week, and the rain this week, it's kind of put a damper on our January. Ingram believes January and February are just rough as it is. So this put a whole new stress on it. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. We actually ran into more issues with supplies than anything. Recent weather made it hard for many local businesses to receive supplies. We are a small business. We do order, you know, off of a truck for a lot of our items. <laughs> We're very conscious about fresh items. A lot of our stuff we get from local stores because we get it in smaller amounts more often during the week so that it is fresh. We ran into issues with local stores. <laughs> While they didn't experience the worst of it, Pappy's Place in Scottsboro is one of many small businesses that were affected. So we ended up closing on that Tuesday because the roads were still pretty bad. I think Huntsville probably got hit a whole lot worse than we did. So we opened back up and we're open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. In Huntsville in places like higher elevations, they got hit a lot harder than we did. Yeah. So most some of our stuff comes from those places. Gotcha. And it was kind of hard for trucks to get to us, but we still, they turned it over pretty good. Yeah. But the Thompsons know a thing or two about how this winter weather can affect the business. We had a freeze last year, if you remember, it's a big freeze. <laughs> and we had problems going on. Everything kept tearing up, kept going, and kept tearing up. We'd fix something and tear up again. We went in one morning, and the pipes and, the, and our heaters was on every which way it could be, and our pipes busted. Mm. And it was probably two inches of water, an inch of water in the lobby, in the kitchen, everywhere. And I just looked her in the eyes. I said, either we find somewhere else to go or Pappy's is done. But Pappy's is far from done, and you can see the difference a year makes on a segment, Food for Thought, on February 26. For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. Inmate Kenneth Smith was put to death by nitrogen hypoxia, a method never tested on humans, and the first time an execution like this has been carried out in the U.S. Smith was put to death at approximately 8.25 p.m. at the William C. Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore. He was convicted for the 1988 murder for hire of a preacher's wife from Sheffield. And according to Smith's spiritual advisor, Reverend Jeff Hood, his final meal was a T-bone steak, hash browns, toast and eggs, all covered in A1 sauce. The nitrogen gas method gained national attention around the world and critics have called it cruel and experimental. This is the first new method of execution used in 42 years. We spoke to one lawyer who broke down why this method of execution was chosen by the state. They picked it because they were having so many problems with their, with their lethal injection executions. Two executions in Alabama, uh, lethal injection executions failed in the sense that the inmates survived both in 2022. That's extraordinary. In this country's history, there have been only five failed lethal injection executions during which the inmates survived. In other words, they lived after that. Before 2009, that has had never happened. It's only because of this experimentation with lethal injection that really started full throttle in 2009. All right, and Governor Kay Ivey releasing a statement following this execution, sharing, quote, the execution was lawfully carried out by nitrogen hypoxia, the method previously requested by Mr. Smith as an alternative to lethal injection. At long last, Mr. Smith got what he asked for, and this case can finally be put to rest. I pray that Elizabeth Senate's family can receive closure after all these years dealing with that great loss and 
we've learned new details on the officers involved in the Steve Perkins case. Appeal hearings have been postponed for all four officers. The personnel board overseeing the hearings announced today that, that the legal counsel for Vance Summers, Joy Williams, Bailey Marquette, and Christopher McAdam all requested the hearings be postponed from next week to a later date. Something important to note is that the board has to be notified no later than the end of the day on July 24th. This is if any of the officers wish to pursue the appeal process. If the board is not notified by that date, the current discipline for each officer will not be reviewed and will continue to be enforced. And what appeared to be progress in changing a controversial public ordinance indicator will be delayed after a single no vote. Councilmember Hunter Pepper's vote prevented any further discussion or official change to the city's parade ordinance at this morning's city council meeting. His vote was met by audible groans from the assembled audience and immediate backlash during the public comment session that followed. Wow, look how long it's taken us to even spark any amount of change in the city since September. And it's just something as simple as a parade ordinance and you can't even immediately consider it even though it's immediately being weaponized against your constituents by our mayor. We as citizens of your city deserve better leadership up here and in that police department. Those comments come amid continued public criticism of the city's handling of the Steve Perkins police shooting death. If passed, the amended ordinance would clarify the number of people required to classify as a parade to five or more and provide exceptions for most picketing or protests. The topic was tabled and will come up again at the next council meeting. Given the population that we serve, which is generally the foreign born and culturally diverse, we find that those are people that are that can become victims of human trafficking quite easily. According to CNN.org, the State Department believes that 72% of human trafficking victims are immigrants. A lot of times they are kind of enticed with the idea of coming to the United States or getting a certain type of work only to get to wherever that destination is and and realize that they've been labor trafficked, essentially. The signs that someone is being trafficked are sometimes not easy to see. Some of the signs that people may overlook is the type of control that one person may have over another. It can also be reflected in how many people live in a household or are being um, controlled with regards to their comings and goings, whether or not their phone is being monitored, those types of things can be signed. And reaching out for help is often intimidating, especially with language barriers. As far as um, why it's difficult to report it in general, selling access to a human being is very, very valuable. And they take, uh, the traffickers take tremendous precautions to keep it a secret and to keep the victim compliant. Many times the victims do not speak English fluently. So we try to make sure that it is that they are aware that we can provide services in their language, even if it's just to figure out or understand what it is that's going on and then offer them the resources from there. Asha Karen is one of many organizations that help many victims, including the foreign born. So Asha Karen is one of the organizations that supports human trafficking victims throughout the state of Alabama. We also work with other organizations throughout the state because obviously not everything is happening here in Huntsville where we are. We provide uh, shelter, emergency shelter, um, direct service resources, in addition to language assistance. And these groups are all working together for one common goal. There are several organizations and agencies that are working to combat human trafficking. We actually collaborate with the Human Trafficking Task Force, the um, Attorney General's Human Trafficking Task Force Alliance. Uh, so we are in collaboration with several organizations that are all working for the same goal, which is to bring these victims to safety. In our previous coverage, we found that having statistical data on the number of cases of victims can be hard to find because of how offenders are prosecuted. While we have strong laws against human trafficking, a lot of times uh, law enforcement will get human traffickers in custody and if it's easier to get them on a racketeering charge, for example, or a kidnapping charge, if that's got teeth and they can make that stick, they're going to want to 
stick them with whatever's going to get them in prison. U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, Prima Escolona, explains why. We have some statutes where we charge for sex trafficking or labor trafficking, but a lot of times in addition to that, we see other crimes that are being committed by those same traffickers. And so what we do is we use every tool in the toolbox. And there's a reason for that. Sometimes if we can charge a statute um, that does not require a victim to have to testify and be re-traumatized, we'll often take that road um, because it serves the victim as well as serving the community and putting that trafficker um, behind bars. And the process has many moving parts. So it comes to us in a variety of ways. There are really two federal agencies that do a lot in the area of human trafficking. One is Homeland Security um, and the other is the FBI. We also see a lot of cases that come in from local law enforcement. Um, and so a lot of times we'll work with our state and local partners when a case presents that could have some federal charges as well as state and local um, charges. Community partners also have a vital role. And then another way that we kind of see cases come in a lot of times is that we have really strong relationships with our community partners and community service partners. And so a lot of times we'll get referrals from that as well, um, where they know of a situation and we're able to get local or federal law enforcement to go investigate. But it always starts with an investigation. We always encourage folks if they have tips or if they see something to report it to either local law enforcement, Department of Homeland Security, or the FBI. For Fox 54 News, I'm Kim McCoy. A sad day for the city of Florence. UNA mourns the loss of Mrs. Ann Howard. Mrs. Ann was a longtime caregiver of Lions Leo III and his sister Una. According to UNA, Mrs. Ann was a fixture in the George H. Carroll Lion Habitat. She was responsible for facilitating their arrival to campus and provided constant care and oversight to both animals. Her work with UNA spans four decades. We definitely send our thoughts to her loved ones and the UNA family. The next legislative session starts in two weeks and Alabama leaders are focused on what they call the red meat issues. Our Ken McCoy has more from today's luncheon. So on the Senate side, what is the Senate going to be taking up? You know, last year we did economic development uh, bills, a whole economic de development package. On the Senate side, I see us early on taking on some what I'm going to refer to as red meat issues. Alabama representatives are just two weeks away from the next legislative session, and there's much to discuss. We kind of covered the, some of the issues we're going to be dealing with in, in, the, in the program in there. I think early on we're going to be talking about election security and school choice. And then we'll move into the economic development section where we're going to try to enhance the programs we've got and make sure our workforce is participating. During today's luncheon, Senator Orr stated that this session will focus on the red meat topics. Well, I think we've seen a lot of interest in public libraries over the uh, past few months. The state archives board composition, the state public health office and the public health officer, uh, the board that appoints him, is he accountable to the, an elected person such as the governor? Those kind of issues that uh, the public has brought to our attention and want addressed. The topic of gaming was also discussed. Rex Reynolds discusses where they are in the process. Well, we, we do have a committee that's working on that. Uh, as the chairman said today, Chairman Witt, there's not a bill out there pre-filed yet, but they, they have developed legislation and they're working with the caucus, uh, both caucuses, both the Republicans and the Democrats, and, and trying to whittle that down. As Speaker Ledbetter's gotten out there and said, uh, we're going to lead with this. We're going we're to put this thing to rest and put, the, put it in a position for Alabamians to vote on it. Sticking to a budget can be tough even for the state of Alabama. We had large budget surpluses, and now it's reverting back to the mean. We're still in, in the black, but uh, we need to be careful that we don't overspend, which could put us in the red in subsequent years. Money in all aspects is what representatives hope to get established in the next legislative session. We're working on the budget now, uh, certainly working with the Senate uh, chairman as well, and with the governor's office. Uh, we've been having, we're down to weekly meetings with the governor's office executive budget office and uh, we've got a follow-up meeting tomorrow in person with the governor. An item up for discussion, prison funding. Our first contract on, on the first mega prison, it nearly doubled in price. We thought we would build two prisons for a little over a billion. Our first one is a, a billion, 600 million. 
uh, in itself. And so we'll, we'll hear tomorrow uh, in a briefing what that price tag is going to be for this Scambia uh, next mega prison. And we'll just have to adjust to that. Prison conditions have been a concern for both staff, inmates, and families. Reynolds shares this funding will address these concerns. This first mega prison they're working on now, um, that will be our medical facility, and, and certainly that, that increased the cost of it. Uh, but certainly, our, you know, our overall medical contract through the uh, ADOC continues to increase. I think it's a problem we got to address. <clears throat> you know, we want to better manage the inmates, moving them from one place to another uh, for, for workforce development, you know, activities within, within the prisons. Uh, but we, we've also got to create a safer environment for our corrections officers. Uh, we're short of officers, and I think that's one thing that we can do to, to help increase uh, our, our workforce participation there. And another item that comes up year after year, Lottery. Well, it depends what's in it. You know, the people I represent, I hear a lot about a lottery, wanting to vote on a lottery. But if it's going to be uh, giving out franchises to gamers or to gaming operations for little or no money to the state, uh, certainly not interested in that. The idea of a gaming bill is currently being worked on. We sent the bill to the House and they've not moved, been able to move it. So Senate this year chose to start the bill in the House and if they can move it, then we'll, we'll take it up. I'm not sure what it looks like. So, and the, and the devil's in the details. Until you see it, you don't know what it looks like. For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. Today, U.S. Representative Dale Strong spoke to the Decatur Morgan County Chamber of Commerce about a few topics, reflecting on the year in office and filling in residents on what national issues he thinks affect the second largest city in his district. Our Simon Williams has the story from the River City. Representative Dale Strong was back in his home district on Tuesday for the Decatur Morgan County Chamber of Commerce's Washington update, where he touted achievements for his first year in office and explained priorities for the year ahead. It's been interesting. I, I feel like it's been more than a year. <laughs> the main theme of the Q&A was how Decatur is situated among the national happenings that federal officials like Strong deal with. Topics range from the hyper-local, like the long-desired construction of another bridge to and from the River City. What we need to do is get our dollars back here locally. You spend them. You figure out where the bridge needs to go. <laughs> it's going to work out. It's going to work out. If it was easy, everybody would do it. The thing that everybody understands, we need another bridge. To foreign policy and immigration from people coming through places on the U.S.-Mexico border. They're coming, and I'm telling you, if you believe those 200-plus that I saw coming through the mountain, that they're coming for jobs, they're not. They're coming to destroy America. In all of his answers, Strong emphasized hardline conservative Republican thinking. And in immediate availability after the formal Q&A, he doubled down. Well, I'll tell you this right here, the southern border is still uh, the number one issue. 8.5 million uh, people have crossed into this country illegally. This is the issue to die on the mountain far. It's time to close the border. Remain in Mexico has got to be instituted. This problem was totally created by the Biden administration. Trump had this under control. Even Obama had this under control. I'll tell you this right here, I want to approve the process of those that are coming illegally and send them back to their country of origin. Right now, you can't have dialogue about asylum and coming into our country whenever you've got them flooding the southern border. The House remains in recess for the week, after which Representative Strong will be back in Washington for the next legislative session, which begins January 29th. Indicator, Simon Williams, Fox 54 News. Here at Huntsville International Airport, travel is going up. In 2023, the airport experienced a record-breaking number of passengers coming through compared to any other year ever. We were really thrilled to mark our largest volume of passenger traffic last year that we ever have. The last benchmark year for us was 2019, and uh, we saw 1.4 million passengers, and this year we saw 1.47 million passengers, so that's a difference of a little over 30,000 passengers. Now this could be for a multitude of reasons. Mm -hmm. Some of the trends we're seeing is the return of business travel. Our week-long warriors are back in the airport, and uh, they're regulars, we see them pretty often, and then also we're uh, seeing more leisure travel as uh, folks increasingly are taking advantage of those breeze flights to nonstop destinations like Las Vegas and Orlando. Or people could be coming here to visit the Rocket City. 
we've seen an increase in uh, deep planning or people who are arriving here. So uh, that could probably translate to increased uh, business. People are traveling and then also maybe we're seeing some leisure travel coming to Huntsville. You know, we have the Orion Amphitheater and so many desirable things, Space Camp. The Huntsville Madison County Convention and Visitors Bureau saw millions of visitors in 2022. We had 3.9 million visitors in 2022, and the economic impact was $2.1 billion. So, uh, and it, it's no surprise that the airport has had greater traffic than, than ever. And although they haven't released 2023's numbers yet, we're expecting the, the numbers for 2023 to be uh, significant increases over 2022 as well. Huntsville International Airport says because of their increase in travelers, airlines are taking notice. You're going to be seeing larger equipment. You might see more flights and you might see uh, more seats available, which is something we've really needed. So whether you're considering visiting Huntsville or taking a trip out of the Rocket City, the Huntsville International Airport hopes you'll consider them. We're so convenient. We're so close to home and uh, we just want people to shop Huntsville first. Taking off here in Huntsville, Sedona Meadows, Fox 54 News. And the end of January is the deadline Athens residents have given the city council to come up with a plan to fix their drainage concerns. And it looks like it's still a work in progress. Arkin McCoy has the story. Put it on the agenda. Make it an official agenda item. Residents are fed up with the way the city of Athens is handling their concerns about sewage infrastructure. I went out there to see. I took videos and that kind of a thing. And, and I saw all of the drainage issues that they were talking about. Uh, that water was coming down from one of the subdivisions, coming straight down into their property. There was another area where the water was coming down into their property. And then I talked to some of those people. These were elderly people. 80, 70 years old, poor people, you know, they don't have much of anything. And that water was piling up all in their backyard. Along with the help of the limestone NAACP, residents gave the council till the end of January to address their concerns. However, the city explains why this item hasn't made the agenda. We have several department heads, the mayor's office, and other people who are working to find the best solution that will be one that is both amenable to the budget of the city and also to providing the best solution for the community. It is being worked on and when we do find the solution that we think will work best, we will go forward with it. Diane Steele with the NAACP calls this a distraction. We have given you every possible opportunity to come to the urgent needs of this community. Rather, you have chosen to deny this community basic city services by not coming up with an infrastructure plan. And if you have come up with one, you haven't chosen to share it with this community. You have come up with nonsense ways to prolong and deny using senseless and intimidating door-to-door -door surveys despite well-documented conditions in this community. For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. All right, well, the city of Madison opened the first ever safe haven baby box in Alabama two weeks ago. The box meant to save precious lives has now been used for the first time, too. I'm told that on Monday afternoon, a baby, newborn baby, was placed right here in the safe haven baby box anonymously. And here's how the process works. Outside of the building, on the other side of this wall, there is a door, and that door can be open. Once the door is open, the baby is placed right here in this safe haven baby box. And from there, once that door closes, it cannot be opened again again it is locked and from that point Madison fire station firefighters take it from there on Monday once the door closed and the alarm sounded firefighters responded within two minutes first responders say the baby was in good health and taken to Madison Hospital your child is safe your child is healthy and the process is already working to make sure that the process of finding your baby a home is worked Monica Kelsey with Safe Haven Baby Boxes believes there's only one word to sum up her emotions in this moment, grateful. So if this parent is out there and watching, I want to talk directly to you. Thank you. 
The original Alabama safe haven law gave people 72 hours to safely surrender at a hospital. But Kids to Love founder and CEO Lee Marshall says one of the things they were adamant about was adding the additional 45 days. We felt like we needed to give women a chance to learn and to really understand themselves and their limits if they're ready to be a mom but just not to be a parent. And that's a fine line that has absolutely no shame whatsoever. Fire Chief Dave Bailey recalls that moment on Monday afternoon. That, that day I, I was here, it was an afternoon. Our, uh, we all were a little bit surprised by this uh, beautiful little healthy baby. And, um, and uh, the baby was uh, extremely cooperative for us, thank goodness. Uh, we, we were able to definitely do a good assessment of the baby, which is in our SOPs. Uh, and any medical care that's needed, in this case, what was not. So we were able to transport the baby. You see we've got our, our infant uh, car carrier here that we, as part of our preparation that and our medical bags. Um, and we were able to do a, a good assessment, vital check, et cetera. Many of us were able to hold the baby for a few minutes. And, uh, and then we were able to take her, our, our uh, paramedics were able to take her just with a, uh, in, a, in a staff vehicle. It's an exciting day for the arts here in the Rocket City. Arts Huntsville teamed up with the local nonprofit to award several organizations in our community. Our Sedona Meadows takes us to the celebration. It's Arts Huntsville's quote 2024 State of the Arts, meant to celebrate this past year while looking ahead to the future. This year we're awarding $300,000 in city funded grants as part of the Arts and Cultural Grant Program and they're supporting 22 local nonprofit organizations. State of the Arts, a clever name coming from a creative bunch who support fellow artists. One of the things I love so much about Huntsville is that they care. This funding here in the Rocket City amplifying the joy of the theater. Theater Huntsville couldn't do what we do without the support of grants from places like Arts Huntsville. While helping bring ideas to life. I think the arts, it should be twin sister to um, the whole space aerospace industry because they both deal with the power of the imagination. 22 art organizations ranging in their creative mediums will receive funding from the city. We project that these grants will serve over 180,000 children and adults in the coming year. And this art grant program in its 12th year wasn't the only thing recognized this evening. A new arts idea is emerging. Applications will be available online tomorrow for arts idea grants, inclusion, diversity, equity and access so that neighborhood associations and diverse cultural organizations can apply for new grant funds to include arts programming at neighborhood events across the city. And although art is visual, it can also be felt. Joy and love and just expressing whatever it is you're feeling. It can give meaning. The theater gave me a home. So as you witness the beauty of the arts here in Huntsville, know there's a space for you. Be good to yourself, be good to your art, and, and make it because if it's in you, um, if it came to you, it, it's supposed to come through you. And trust me, the world needs it. More information on this funding can be found at fox54.com. That's it for this edition of the Week in Review. Remember, we have so much more local content for you to sample every day on Fox 54 Plus. It's available for free on Roku, Fire TV, and Apple TV devices. For breaking news and weather anytime, have our mobile apps at the ready as well. For the Fox 54 News team, I'm Kenesha D. See you next time.